You're listening to a sermon podcast from Redemption Hill Church, recorded at one of our worship services. Let's open our books, our Bibles to Acts 25. Acts 25, open your Bibles, your physical Bible or electronic Bible, Acts 25. As you open it, let me put us back into the context. Where are we? We are in Acts 25. Paul has been seized by the Jews. He's at the temple and that's where he's been seized. Paul has been arrested by the Romans. For the last two years, he was imprisoned by the Roman governor, Felix. And now, as we go into Acts 25, a new governor, Festus, has arrived. And in Acts 25, we see how he's trying to settle in and figure out what's going on. That's what Acts 25 is about. So let me read the Word of God, Acts 25, verse 1. Now, three days after Festus had arrived in the province, he went up to Jerusalem from Caesarea, and the chief priests and the principal men of the Jews laid out their case against Paul, and they urged him, asking as a favor against Paul, that he summon him to Jerusalem because they were planning an ambush to kill him on the way. Festus replied that Paul was being kept at Caesarea and that he himself intended to go there shortly. So, said he, let the men of authority among you go down with me, and if there is anything wrong about the men, let them bring charges against him. Verse 6, after he stayed among them not more than eight or ten days, he went down to Caesarea. And the next day, he took his seat on the tribunal and ordered Paul to be brought. When he had arrived, the Jews who had come down from Jerusalem stood around him, bringing many and serious charges against him that they could not prove. Paul argued in his defense, neither against the law of the Jews, nor against the temple, nor against Caesar have I committed any offense. But Festus, wishing to do the Jews a favor, said to Paul, Do you wish to go to Jerusalem and there be tried on these charges before me? But Paul said, I am standing before Caesar's tribunal, where I ought to be tried. To the Jews, I have done no wrong, as you yourself know very well. If then I am a wrongdoer and have committed anything for which I deserve to die, I do not seek to escape death. But if there is nothing to their charges against me, no one can give me up to them, I appeal to Caesar. Then Festus, when he had conferred with his counsel, answered, To Caesar you have appealed, to Caesar you shall go. Verse 13, Now some, when some days had passed, Agrippa the king and Bernice arrived at Caesarea and greeted Festus. And as they stayed there many days, Festus laid Paul's case before the king, saying, There is a man left prisoner by Felix, and when I was at Jerusalem, the chief priests, And the elders of the Jews laid out their case against him, asking for a sentence of condemnation against him. I answered them that it was not the custom of the Romans to give up anyone before the accused met the accusers face to face and had opportunity to make his defense concerning the charge laid against him. So when they came together here, I made no delay, but on the next day I took my seat on the tribunal and ordered the man to be brought up. Verse 18, when the accusers stood up, they brought, out, they brought no charge in his case of such evils as I suppose. Rather, they had certain points of dispute with him about their own religion and about a certain Jesus who was dead, but whom Paul asserted to be alive. Being at a loss how to investigate these questions, I asked whether he wanted to go to Jerusalem and be tried there regarding them. But when Paul had appealed to be kept in custody for the decision of the emperor, I ordered him to be held until I could send him to Caesar. Then Agrippa said to Festus, I would like to hear the man myself. Tomorrow, said he, you will hear him. So on the next day, Agrippa and Bernice came with great pomp, pomp, and they entered the audience hall with the military tribunes and the prominent men of the city. Then at the command of Festus, Paul was brought in, And Festus said, King Agrippa and all who are present with us, you see this man about whom the whole Jewish people petitioned me both in Jerusalem and here, shouting that he ought not to live any longer. But I found that he had done nothing deserving death. And as he himself appealed to the emperor, I decided to go ahead and send him. But I have nothing definite to write to my lord about him. Therefore, I have brought him before you all, and especially before you, King Agrippa, so that after we have examined him, 
I may have something to write. For it seems to me unreasonable in sending a prisoner not to indicate the charges against him. These are the true words of the living God. Amen. I was really glad this morning when I came and we started to worship and the songs were all about King Jesus, right? Uh, King forever, King of the heavens, King of my soul. And uh, my conviction is X25 is about a certain thing. Why is X25 relevant to all of us? It might seem like an interesting account, almost historical. It is historical, right? A, a story there. Why is it relevant? Well, first of all, what is X25? X25 is the continuing story of Paul and his defense against the Jews. So X25 is the continuing story that began in X21. And in the larger context of the book of Luke and the gospel of the book of Acts, it is a continuing story of how the risen Christ appeared and how uh, his saving work began and how his saving work continues True people like Paul, empowered by the Holy Spirit. It is a continuing story. And as we know, in the Bible, the story ends in the book of Revelation. So here's where it is relevant to us, right? Here is a story. The question is, so what's so interesting or relevant about these Roman and Jewish people in, uh, in Jerusalem, in Caesarea 2,000 years ago? Why it is relevant is this, this. This story that I told you about, the story of the Bible, we know it ends in the Bible in Revelation, but in our living, in human history, the story hasn't ended. The story ends when Jesus comes again. In other words, you and I, we are still in the story, right? We are not in the Bible, but, in, but we are in the story of salvation. And that's why this is relevant to us, because this is a small chapter in how God saves people, and you are in that continuing story. Now, when we look at all these trial accounts of Paul against the Jewish people, you can look at underlying things in how people respond. You can look at internal things, righteousness, how people uh, respond. But today, I want to bring your attention to this overarching thing that actually forces people to respond in a certain way. And what is this overarching thing? The thing I want to point out today is authority. Authority, right? What is authority? One way I define authority is something outside of us that makes us uh, do things we, we do. Whether we want to do it or not, it forces us to do certain things. That's authority, right? Authority is the thing that makes you stop at a traffic light. Authority is the thing that makes you pay your taxes. Authority is the thing that makes you start to uh, arrive at work on time. Authority is the thing that makes you obey God. X25, we see various people under various authorities and how they respond. Now here's our problem. We are, if we find ourselves in this story, we are in a situation where there are multiple authorities pulling at us for our allegiance and we don't know where to go. We don't know who to follow. We don't know what direction to take. So... X25 helps us in this. And my aim today, right, is to, to show you that X25 shows us that the authority of the risen Christ enables us to live life with a clear direction and with resolute confidence. Because this is indeed what it is doing to Paul. And it is indeed what it can do to us. Okay, what it can do for us. So I'm going to divide my sermon into three portions. The first portion is the authority of human institutions. Second portion is the authority of the, the authority Paul lived under, and then finally the authority of the risen living Christ. Before we continue, let me pray to Jesus Christ, our King. Our Father in heaven, we thank you that we have come here this morning because you invited us to come to hear your word to let your word pierce our hearts, to let your word examine our responses, to let your word examine our reactions to Jesus Christ. Lord, you are our rock, you are our redeemer, you are our Lord. So today, Lord, I pray that your, work, your word gives us a clear idea, Lord, that Jesus, you have authority over all things, that you are the king forever, you are the king of the heaven, and Lord, may you be the king of our souls. I pray this in Jesus' name. 
Amen. All right, the authority of human institution. Who's in charge? You step into a room, how do you figure out who's in charge, right? It might be the biggest person, the strongest person, but it is how people behave and say in this certain environment that makes you think they're in charge, right? So I am a, I'm a surgeon, right? And my wife would sometimes say, you're going to be late for surgery, and I'll tell her, surgery doesn't start without me, right? <laughs> yeah, it's true, it's true, right? It's true. <clears throat> but when I go in, I act like I'm the king, right? And I am, right? I do stuff, give me stuff, right? But when the patient goes into trouble, the anesthetist say, stop, I have to stop. So who's the real king? Actually, in some sense, it's the anesthetist, right? Because if the anesthetist says, I'm going to wake the patient up, I have no choice, right? So who is the real king? So in this situation, who is the real king? In Acts 25, who is the real king? Let's look at Festus. So let's look at Festus and all the authorities that he is under. Okay, Festus, obviously, he's the new Roman governor. And uh, what authority is he under? He's under the authority of Roman law. He's under the authority of the Roman emperor. He's under the authority of Caesar. Now, Festus, compared to Felix, is more honest, more efficient. Uh, he works fast. Verse 1. Three days after he arrives, he goes to... Uh, Jerusalem from Caesarea. Um, verse 6, he stays with them for 8 to 10 days. He's like, whoa, chop, 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 right? He does all these things on schedule. He's focused, he's hardworking, he's very efficient. Um, so you can see, right, that his primary allegiance is to Rome and to Caesar. For Festus and all the people in the Roman kingdom and Roman world at that time, all roads lead to Rome. All power belongs to Caesar because Caesar commands life and death, provisions, taxes, everything. That's, that's, uh, that's Caesar. And you can see how strong Caesar's hold on Festus is, right? All it takes is for Paul to just invoke Caesar's name. I appeal to Caesar and immediately Festus's hands are tied. He is restricted in how he can respond. He has no choice because this Roman citizen, under Roman law, appealed to the Roman emperor, and there's now this route for Festus to take, and that's only one route, and that is to allow him, to send him to, to Rome. So Festus's primary allegiance was to Rome and to Caesar. But Festus is not only under Roman law and under the, the authority of the Roman emperor, he's also under the authority of other human institutions and dynamics. How do you see that? We see how he's trying to establish Quan Si, right? He's trying to establish relationships. He's trying to win the favor of the principal men of the Jews. Uh, he actually listens to their requests to bring Paul to Jerusalem. He continues to establish relationships um, by entertaining Agrippa, the, uh, the, the puppet king of the Jews, right? Um, this is functional. This is necessary. And it is authoritative in the minor sense that if you ignore all these things, your life, his life, and our lives don't work so well. It's true, right? You cannot just follow the rules. You need to have some relational things. So there are these power dynamics at work. Okay? What other authority begins to impose uh, himself or, or itself on Festus? It is the authority of God, of Jesus, the risen Christ. We don't see much of Festus. We only see him in this short one chapter. But in that one chapter, how does Festus respond? The only response we can see Festus has regarding Jesus is in verse 19. And he is now passing on an almost third-hand account of what, who Jesus is. And here's what he says, right? He is talking to Agrippa and he says, Rather, they had certain points of dispute with him about their own religion and about a certain Jesus who was dead. He's not really specific about who this, this Jesus is. Maybe he's too busy, but he doesn't seem interested. Compared to his predecessor, right? His predecessor, how does his predecessor respond to the news or the knowledge of, uh, of Jesus? Let me bring you back to Acts 24, verse 22. What does it say about Felix there? But Felix, having a rather accurate knowledge of the way, 
So Felix had an accurate knowledge of the way. And then, when Paul spoke to Felix, here's what it says, right? Um, and as he, this is Paul, as he reasoned about righteousness and self-control and the coming judgment, Felix was alarmed. Why does Felix have to be alarmed? He is the governor, the highest authority in Jerusalem and Judea, and his king, his emperor, is the highest authority in all Roman lands. Well, he was alarmed because when he heard the truth from this prophet, this apostle of God, that there is judgment, he knows, he senses that there is a higher judgment, right? So when the authority of God, when the news of God's judgment, uh, his, how he judges us, how he assesses our self-control, how he assesses our righteousness, when it comes upon us, there is usually a reaction. Festus, we don't see it yet, but in Felix, we see it. He doesn't care enough. Felix, even at that time, he didn't care enough. And what did he say to Paul? He said, go away for now. And that's what people who are so preoccupied with human institutions and the horizontal power dynamics, when you are so preoccupied with that, when the news of Jesus, the bad news and the good news of Jesus Christ comes upon you, you can choose to ignore it and focus on other things or you can tell the person who's telling you to go away. So as you think about Festus and all the authorities trying to pull him into allegiance. The question then is, how might we be like Festus? Like Festus, we are all caught up in human institutions. Many of us are working, some of us are studying. We all, every one of us, have a government over us. There are no sovereign people here, right? So, yeah, all of us have a government over us, right? And we deal with that, we struggle with that, right? But the thing is, to not be so entangled or distracted by that, that we start to ignore Jesus when he calls. We start to ignore his words when he comes, when he speaks to us. We do not want to do that. And so as we think about this, the question then is, today, to all of you, who are in all these institutions that are tugging at your allegiance, is God speaking to you today? If God is speaking you, to you today, will you just open your ears and open your hearts and see that through all these things, amongst all these things, there is an overarching authority that we don't see very obviously in Acts 25 until we dig into it. All right? So that's Festus. What about the Jewish leaders? So Jewish leaders, um, they are... Let's, let's look, at, look at them. Let's look at what institutions are pulling um, their allegiance, what authorities press down on these Jewish leaders. There is the authority of Roman law. So these Jewish leaders might say, we have so much power over our Jewish um, citizens, over the people of Jewish faith, but the reality is their hands are tied. And I think it's most obvious when you look at them and Paul, right? They are like a cat that wants to eat a fish in a goldfish bowl, right? And Paul is that fish inside there. They want to get at it, but the goldfish bowl of Roman law doesn't allow them to put their hands inside. See that? So even though they think they have religious authority, their hands are constrained by Roman law. So they have uh, over them the authority of Roman law. What about the authority of what they really are passionate about? What about the authority of Jewish law? What about the authority of the Jewish faith, the Ten Commandments? They have, we know, received the law, the commandments. They are do doing their utmost to observe the law, that God gave to Israel. But here's the thing, right? They've received it and they're trying to live it out, but they are still bound by the law. They're still condemned by the law. If they, know, if they know what the law is meant to do, this is what it's meant to do, right? The law is meant to tell them that here's the perfect list of things that God wants you to do if you want to come into the kingdom and you can't do it. The law needs fulfillment. And the fulfiller of the law is Jesus Christ. So until they recognize that this man that they crucified some years ago was the one that liberated them from the commands of the law, they were bound, condemned, confined by the law. So it's kind of ironic, right, that this authority of the law over them actually is killing them because they stumble over the good news of Jesus. There's another authority that uh, the Jewish leaders 
have over them. That's not so explicit but can be seen on their actions. And that is the authority of sin. That is the authority of their sinful flesh. How do you see that? Here is a people who say they are Jewish, faithful people who understand all the commandments and try and adhere to it on one hand. On the other hand, they are trying to kill Paul. Right? Thou shalt not kill, right? But they are absolutely trying to do that. And you can see here, they are bending to the authority of sinful flesh over them. Here's the law. I don't want to think about it yet. I just want to kill Paul. So that is the other authority that's, that's sort of infringing on them, pulling on them. And then finally, of course, there's the authority of God, the authority of Jesus Christ. And what happens when they encounter Jesus? Jesus himself said, right, when these people encounter me, some of them will stumble. And they are the ones who will stumble. They are the ones confined by the law, bound by the law, condemned by the law. When the fulfillment of the law came, they stumbled over him. They put him up on the cross and they killed him. So these are the Jewish leaders. How might we be like the Jewish leaders? We are not separate from them. We are not completely dissimilar to them. How might we be similar to them? I think we might be, more, we might be similar to them when our faith is more a religion rather than a relationship. We might be similar to them when our misconception of entering into the kingdom of God is about obeying better, doing more things rather than coming to the saving work of Jesus Christ, right? When our conception of Christianity is about what I need to do rather than who I need to turn to, when that happens, that's when we become more and more like these Jewish leaders, yeah? What about Agrippa and Bernice that we see in chapter 25, verses 13 onwards? Who's Agrippa and who's Bernice? Agrippa is the, uh, the puppet king that the Jews had over them, and he had nominal power. Yeah, I think he had some power over the, the chief priests and the Sanhedrin, but this power was nominal. He was like a ceremonial king. Okay? Bernice uh, was his wife and also his sister. I know it's kind of weird, but that's, that's what they were, how they were living, right? Now, the thing about Agrippa and Bernice is I find it very illustrative, right? That, just think about this. Right? Here is somebody who calls himself a king, but he is actually powerless because over him is the Roman Empire. And I think it's illustrative because this is a small picture of the larger reality, right? What's the larger reality? All the kingdoms on earth, every single one, the Soviet Union, America, China, they think they are the kings, and for a while they are, but there is an overarching power over them that when this overarching power says stop, they will stop, right? Rome is to Agrippa what God is to the world. That's, that's how it strikes me, the inclusion of Agrippa and Bernice in this picture. And as you think about Agrippa and as you think about Bernice, here's, here's the truth, right? All human sovereignty, all human power on this horizontal level is conferred, is limited, and is temporary. So all this human power is conferred by God, it is limited in scope, and it's always temporary. Because eventually God will come back to claim everything which he already, belong, he already owns, right? So that's the authority of human institution. Now let's look at Paul. Let's look at Paul and the, uh, the authority that Paul lived under. You know Paul's story? Paul was brought up as a Jew born in Tarsus in Cilicia, Roman citizen, Jewish scholar. Um, he was a, a rabid, pharisaical uh, proponent of let's act against the Christians. That's who Paul was. Um, what kind of authority was he under? Just looking at Acts 25, we can see that he's under the authority of Roman law. He is under the authority of Jewish law. And there's one other thing um, which we haven't talked about. That's the law of his flesh. Uh, I'll talk about that a little bit later. Okay? Now, all these allegiances were there before he became a Christian. 
all these allegiances and authorities over him are still there when he became a Christian, but they are transformed. They are transformed by the realization that all these authorities are now subsumed under the authority of God. And, and that's, this is what it looks like. So Paul is our example. What is he our example of? He's our example of how the authority of the risen Christ can override all the other authorities that try to rule over us and try to claim us. Uh, if you want to try and summarize what, how Paul acts, Paul continues to be respectful and obedient insofar as his obedience did not run counter to God's rule and counter to God's mission for him. He had boundaries with respect to obeying Roman law. He had boundaries with respect to obeying Jewish, uh, the Jewish leaders, right? With respect to the Jewish leaders, Paul was an adherent of the law. He followed the law. Acts, um, Acts 21 verse 24. This is what he said about, uh, about Paul. Thus all will know that there is nothing in what they have been told about you, but that you, this is about Paul, but that you yourself also live in observance of the law. So Paul followed the law in as much as it didn't ask him to denounce Jesus. And you can see he also respected the offices of the Jewish uh, leaders, right? And we see this in verse 20, uh, Acts 23, verse, verse 4 and 5. What happens is the Jewish leaders were, were accusing him and then he calls them a whitewashed wall. And then this is what is said to Paul. Verse 4. Those who stood, stood by said, Would you revile God's high priest? And Paul said, I did not know, brothers, that he was a high priest, for it is written, You shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. So even though Paul had this idea, and it was true, that these leaders were whitewashed tombs, he still obeyed the office of the law in as much as he paid, he honoured them. And so he, he sort of drew back on his, his polemic against them. So that's Paul with respect to Jewish law. Paul with respect to Roman law. He was respectful. He was obedient to a degree. Um, the trial that we see in Acts 25 is very similar to the previous trials except for one new detail. What is that new detail? That new detail is in 25 verses 10 to 11, right? So Paul knew that the Jewish leaders wanted him to be transported to, from Caesarea to Jerusalem. And in the course of that, they would ambush him and kill him, right? So what did Paul do? Paul invoked the power, the authority of Roman law over Jewish law. And he called on the name of Caesar to be brought before Caesar. Paul appealed to a higher authority when faced by Jewish law. So when we look at this, what are Paul's new boundaries? Remember I said Paul was adherent to all these institutions before and after? With respect to Jewish law, his new boundary is not stopping to point to Christ as the fulfillment of the law. He continued to obey the law, but he never stopped pointing to them that here's the law that I obey, here's the fulfillment of the law. This is Jesus Christ. That's his new boundary. What about his new boundary with respect to Roman law? His new boundary is to not stop declaring that Jesus Christ died and rose again and continuing to give his testimony. That is his new boundary. He followed everything else, right? That Roman law required him. And then finally, the, the authority of his flesh. Now, I think if I tell you, I try to explain to you what it means, you will agree with me. We are all under the authority of our flesh on two levels, right? One is a purely physical level. If I need to go to the toilet, the authority of my flesh tells me go to the toilet, right? No other law is going to stop me from going to the toilet. That's just the physical level, right? But there's another aspect to it, and that is the flesh that the, the Bible speaks of as is in the carnality of who I am. What do I mean by that? When I believe in Jesus Christ, my spirit, which was dead, I'm given a new spirit. I'm alive in Christ. I'm a new spirit man in Christ but I'm still encased in mortal flesh, vulnerable, susceptible mortal flesh. And that mortal flesh is subject to temptation, and that mortal flesh can complain and walk against how my spirit actually wants me to walk. 
You get an account of this in Romans 7 when Paul says, here's what I want to do, but I cannot do it. His spirit wants me to, him to do a certain way, but his body says, let's not do, let's not do this. Let's, let's rebel, let's sin. And that is, that is that authority that continues to rule over Paul and continues to, continues to rule over all of us. That authority is not completely relinquished until we meet Jesus again. We may be saved, but we continue to sin. And that is why every Sunday we come here and we confess. Because even the justified people need to be sanctified week by week. We confess because even though saved, we fall and we sin. So that's his new boundary, right? His new boundary with respect to his flesh is this. His direction and his strength, when his strength, when his strength fails, when his flesh fails, in perplexing situations, where does he gain strength? Where does he gain clarity? Where does he gain direction? He gains it by looking at the resurrected Jesus Christ. He gains it by claiming the authority of God's power over him. Paul's problem is, is not an ancient, forgotten problem because today we find ourselves, right, in the situation of vying authorities, right? We have so many authorial institutions pulling at us, so many things that pull at us for our, our allegiance and our loyalty that very often we are confused about what to do. Um, I spoke with a, a woman who has an elderly father uh, in hospital for the last four months. And this guy, the father, wants to go home. The doctor says if he goes home, he's probably going to die. Um, and then the, this woman's older siblings tell her to do certain things. So here's a woman under tension because there are authorities pulling at her. What authorities are there? That's the authority of her father, right? Father, how do you honor your father? Do you follow everything he says? Well, not really, right? The authority of the doctors. The doctor says, if you bring him home, he's going to die, right? The authority of the siblings. You are the older sibling. Maybe it is my role to honor you. What other authority rules over her? The authority of Jesus Christ, right? The risen Lord. So in that kind of situation, she needs wisdom. She needs direction, right? And the wisdom and the direction is honor your father such that his abuse, his scolding of you, just washes over you, but you love him in the way that God directs you to love him. And all these things have to be balanced, right? Um, do you honor him? Is refusing to bring him home dishonoring him? Uh, is refusing, is getting angry at what he's saying to you dishonoring him? It probably is, right? But what is making you feel guilty? What is making you feel angry at all these things is the other authority that's pulling at you. And the other authority that's putting at this person is a flesh. So into this, this combustible mix, you make sure that your eyes are fixed on Jesus Christ, who has authority over you to tell you that stop your flesh from feeling angry, stop your flesh from feeling guilty, and just trust in Jesus Christ for the next step to do. Right? So we are all in our lives, in these tensions, in these situations where there's so much tension, right? And as I ask you people, right, I'm sure you've got tussles with institutional authority um, in your workplace. You might have inst tussles with institutional authority with government organizations. You may have tussles with authority in your family, regarding your parents, regarding your children. In these things, do not let the human institution, the authority of the institution, do not let the authority of the flesh pull you away from the wisdom that the resurrected Jesus, whose authority lies over you. Don't let that take away from the wisdom that he gives you. Okay? So Paul lived the way he lived because the authority of the risen Christ enabled him uh, to fix his eyes with greater clarity and greater direction. Now what is... This last portion that I want to talk about is the authority of the risen Christ. What is it about the risen Christ that changed Paul's outlook on all these authorities that, that rule over his life? When I think of authority, um, I think there are two things that come to mind. Right? There are some people who earn their authority. 
there are some people who have a conferred authority. So as you think about Jesus, if I say Jesus had an earned authority, I know some of you will push back, right? But here's the thing, right? Jesus was God, the Son of God, right? And he came and in his incarnation, he put on human flesh. And when he put on human flesh, it tells us this, right? That it wasn't enough that God wrote the narrative that we are talking about, the human story that, that we are talking about, but he wrote himself into it. God wrote the narrative, he wrote his son into it, his son put on human flesh. And in living a human life, subject to all the temptations that we are subject to and resisting all of them perfectly, in obeying the law perfectly, Jesus earned in authority. Because when we look at Jesus, we cannot say, you don't understand what kind of uh, pain I'm going through. You don't understand the temptation I'm going through. Because he lived life as a human being, he understands. He knows what he's talking about. He knows what I'm feeling. So that's what I mean by ha him having his earned authority. Now, with his incarnation, Jesus also found himself under authority, right? He found himself under the authority of Jewish law. How did he respond to that? He was the only man to ever perfectly fulfill um, Jewish law, the Ten Commandments. He found himself under Roman law. And how did he respond to that? He responded within the bounds that his father allowed him to. And he said, give unto Caesar what is Caesar. So he honored Roman authority over him to the point of allowing them to crucify him on a cross. Did he struggle with the other authority that I talked about, which is his flesh? He did, right? In the Garden of Gethsemane, what did he not do? He did not let his human flesh have authority over the will of his father. And so he cried out to the Father, if this is your will, yes, yeah. And then he went to the cross for us. And all this is, subject, is him subjecting himself to the divine plan of the Father. And that is Jesus' conferred authority, his eternal authority. Colossians chapter 1, verse 16 tells us that even before he became a man, even before his incarnation, Jesus, the eternal Son of God, he has always had absolute authority over all of us, right? For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. He had a pre-existent authority that became more fully realized in his incarnation. And today, he has this authority as he sits at the Father's right hand. Now, if you read about the account of <clears throat> John's vision of uh, what happens in the throne room in heaven, you go to Revelation chapter 5, verses 12 to 13. Here is where Jesus reigns. Here is Je where Jesus exercises his complete and absolute authority over all human institution. And instead of, seeing, instead of seeing a warrior king, what do you see? You see a lamb, right? Worthy is the lamb who was slain. To him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be blessing and honor and glory. This reminds us that, you know, sometimes when you come to church and you talk about Jesus, we focus on this thing that is true of him, that he is a merciful, gracious God who loves us and welcomes us with open arms. He's kind of a softly, softly God, right? There's this other thing that we cannot run away from, right? That this softly, softly God, this Lamb of God who died on the cross for us, who surrendered himself to the Father's will, the Lamb is also the ultimate authority who sits on a throne that will overpower and is power and authority over all human institutions even today. So this is a God with a firm hand who will come one day in judgment. So this is Jesus' conferred eternal authority. So when Paul encountered the risen Christ, the first, the first title that he called the risen Christ on his encounter is Lord. And that tells us that at that moment, he realized that here is my God, here is the fulfillment of the law. And from now onwards, as can be evidenced from his life, he began to live under the complete authority of Jesus Christ. So what does Jesus' authority mean for those who submit to it? 
Well, it means this, right? It means that his sovereign rule overrides all other authority over us. That's one thing, right? It also means that we can appeal, right? Chapter 25, verse 11. This is Paul appealing to Caesar. Remember what I said about this? Paul is appealing to a higher authority um, over the Jews. The Jews are trying to kill him. Paul appealed to a higher authority. In the same way, whatever institutions try to squeeze and crush and kill us on this earth, we can appeal to a higher authority who is not Rome, who is not Caesar, but who is Jesus Christ, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And he hears you and he will answer you and he protects you because he is our sovereign king. How do we respond to the authority of Jesus Christ? How do we respond? I think the first thing is to know this, that Jesus already has authority over you. Why? Because by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. Jesus already has that authority. Knowing this, here's the other thing. His authority arches over all creations. His authority arches over your life. His authority arches over you whether you accept it or not. This is the truth that I'm speaking to you. And so, as I say these things, if you do not accept Jesus' authority, there will come a day at the end of your history when you will meet Jesus at the end of your life and at that time, your life will need to be accounted for and you will be judged for it. So if you are not, if you have not submitted yourself to the authority of Jesus Christ over you, I implore you to listen to God's invitation to you. If, on the other hand, you have accepted it, then hear this. The authority of Jesus Christ will enable you to live life with a clear direction and with resolute confidence whatever prison you find yourself in, whatever tension or other authority is pulling at you, the authority of Jesus Christ will enable you to live life with a clear direction. I want to finish by encouraging us to think about, you know, you, you listen to a sermon, right? Um, very often, the preacher will say, here's what we should be doing, here's what we should be pre- uh, teaching, um, changing, let me invite us, right, when we look back at Acts 25, I want to invite you to think about how you will pray in response to this chapter of God's Word that is given to you. And let's think about praying in three ways, right? When you look at a passage like this, and this is my invitation to you over the coming days and weeks to pray. The first thing is to pray prayers of praise. What does that mean? When I look at Acts 25, what is praiseworthy about God? that I can find here, that is just apart from me. What is these absolute true things about Jesus that I can praise him for? I can praise him that he reigns over all creation. I can praise him that he's wise, he's loving, he's sovereign over all things. I can praise him because Jesus earned his authority to have empathy over me because he suffers and he suffered um, worse things than I would ever suffer and he was tempted worse than I, I could be tempted. So I can pray prayers of praise. And I can also pray prayers of confession. And that's what I want to lead you into now, which is a time of repentance and confession. And what do we need to repent about and confess about? As we look at Acts 25, we see, right, authorities vying for our loyalty. And now as we think about our lives, we realize, right, that at some points we have succumbed to the authority of human institutions. We have succumbed to the authority of our flesh over against what God is telling us. So I want to spend a moment, a minute, for all of you to think about the authorities in your life. If you are a Christian, you would have said that Jesus is ultimately the king over you, but you might not have behaved like that, right? So let's spend a moment thinking about, reflecting, and then repenting and confessing how you have let other authorities overrule Christ's authority over you. And I'll pray uh, a prayer of um, assurance for us. Let's do that. Let's do that for one minute.
Our Father in heaven, as we allow the words of Acts 25, let's descend in our hearts, Lord, as we look at the various authorities vying for power. Lord, we confess that you have absolute power and authority over all things. We confess, Lord, that there are many times in our lives when we let human authority, human institution, the authority of our own flesh, just pull us away from obeying you, from loving you, from following your will. Forgive us, Lord, in all these things. And Lord, we, we know as we pray, as we repent, as we confess that you have forgiven us, Lord, because even as we think of you as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, we realize, Lord, the Lamb on the throne also tells us that you, Jesus Christ, died for our sins and when we confess, you have forgiven us and you have assured us and we stand rooted in you. So Lord, we give thanks to you that you, your word opens our eyes, helps us to turn inwards to look at how we have sinned and our hearts, Lord, just swells with the assurance that you give us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. So we pray prayers of praise. We pray prayers of confession and repentance. Here's the third thing I want you to pray about, which is a petition. You, this week, petition against the ongoing struggles and battles with authority that you have. You, this week, pray about the, author the authorial tensions that you have in your lives and pray for wisdom to honour and to obey with wisdom and with humility and with surrender, trusting that Jesus Christ will lead you through all these things. Let me pray in finishing. Our Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for reminding us that you are king over all things. You are the king of kings. You are the sovereign Lord. You are the lamb on the throne. And Lord, you rule over all things. So I ask, Lord, that your word descends into us and that your word resounds in our thinking and our living this week and that our hearts are turned to you, Lord, that we may obey you uh, with great humility, with great dependence, and with great wisdom. We pray that you'll be glorified in these things. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You've been listening to a sermon podcast from Redemption Hill Church. You can find more of our sermons online at www.rhc.org.sg.